The Evolution of Rihanna's Style If you ask the average person who they thought the most fashion-forward celebrity was, odds are they'd respond with Rihanna. And you know what? It's a solid answer considering all of the memorable looks she's had in the 18 years since she rose to fame. Starting from rather humble beginnings, the 35-year-old multi-hyphenate has evolved from an up-and-coming Barbadian musician to a billionaire businesswoman, making a name for herself not only as an artist and entrepreneur, but as a style icon. Compared to actors, musicians are more likely to have distinct style eras due to their creative projects having specific sounds and visuals that need to be translated into music videos and performance attire. While you could argue that the sexism in the music industry pressures female artists to reinvent themselves every few years in order to stay relevant, there are male musicians like David Bowie, The Beatles, and Harry Styles who've also changed their looks with the changing times. At the end of the day, it really comes down to an artist's creative process. And when it comes to Rihanna, it genuinely feels like her clothing is just as important as anything else. In today's video, we'll be taking a look at the evolution of Rihanna's style over the years, from her casual hip-hop beginnings, to her edgy bad girl era, to her influential it girl style. We'll be looking at everything from her red carpet attire, music video looks, and street style, and examine how it relates to her creative endeavors and public image. I've dissected other celebrities' style, career, and public persona in previous video essays, but when it comes to Rihanna, the research I needed to do was on a whole other level. With nearly two decades worth of photos, music videos, movies, and interviews to sift through, trying to keep everything organized was honestly really overwhelming, which is where today's sponsor, Milanote, comes in. Milanote is a customizable digital space that helps you plan your creative projects in whatever way makes the most sense for you. With hundreds of different templates to choose from, whether you're writing a paper, building a brand, thinking up a photo shoot, starting a podcast, or in my case, producing a video essay, Milanote makes the process easy from start to finish. As someone who's always working on several different things at once, staying on track can be super difficult. And I've tried all sorts of things, notebooks, post-its, nothing worked. With Milanote, I can easily keep track of my progress, save articles to use as references, create a script outline, save images, and jot down little notes all in one place. Milanote was super useful for this video because I was able to create different mood boards for all of Rihanna's different musical eras. Since everything was organized in one place, it was way easier to recognize recurring motifs like her color palette, designers, and inspirations. Since I was able to visualize her style evolution more clearly from the very beginning of the project and keep track of what needed to be finished next, it made the actual writing process a breeze because all of the information was already right in front of me. Milanote also makes it easy to share your work with others, whether you're just looking for feedback or actually want to collaborate. All you need to do is invite them to your board. The best part is that Milanote is currently available for free with no time limit. So sign up using the link in my description and get started on your next creative project. Now let's get back to the video. Robin Rihanna Fenty was born on the island of Barbados on February 20th, 1988, and the future fashionista found herself gravitating towards music at an early age as an escape from her difficult home life. After auditioning for American record producer Evan Rogers in 2003, Rihanna began working with him on a demo tape, traveling between Barbados and the United States during her school holidays in order to complete it. This demo eventually made its way to Def Jam Recordings, where it was heard by newly appointed CEO Jay-Z, who went on to sign Rihanna to the label in early 2005 when she was only 17. Rihanna immediately dropped out of high school, relocated to the US, and began working on her debut album, Music of the Sun. Released in August 2005, the album was inspired by her Caribbean roots and incorporated dancehall beats and reggae vocals, creating a unique sound that would reappear in her later discography. As an up-and-coming artist, she didn't exactly have the biggest wardrobe budget, so the label kept her look fairly simple and accessible by focusing on a youthful hip-hop-inspired style that combined feminine elements like sequins, crop tops, and bright colors with masculine motifs like baggy pants, sneakers, and hoodies. As was trendy at the time, she'd often wear her pants down low, with the waistband of her underwear becoming just as much a part of the outfit as her jewelry. It honestly reminded me a lot of what Aaliyah used to wear in the 90s, just a bit more playful and with some undeniable mid-2000s influences. 
in the music video for It's Lovin' That You Want, Rihanna sported a handful of beachy looks that perfectly encapsulated the island vibes of the album. And I was honestly surprised that apart from the occasional bikini top, they didn't lean into that aesthetic more over the course of the era, as it felt like a perfect fit for her image at the time. Although she was only 17 years old, there's no denying that her clothing aired on the sexier side, considering the amount of skin showing. But with these looks being so casual and sporty, they still felt like something someone her age would actually wear. This cool girl next door type of vibe made her approachable, which is a great strategy when you're initially establishing a fan base. On occasion, she would sport outfits that fell outside of this predetermined style, but I'm not gonna lie, they never felt right for her, lacking the cool factor of her usual attire. Although these looks feel distinctly of their time, there actually weren't any other artists who dressed in a similar fashion, highlighting how even at the start of her career, when she didn't have nearly as many resources, Rihanna was still challenging the style status quo. Her second album, A Girl Like Me, was released less than a year after her first, and followed in its predecessor's reggae pop footsteps. Now 18 years old, Rihanna's look differed drastically from her previous era, with the label positioning her as more mature in the hopes of having her be taken more seriously by the industry at large. For red carpet events and high-profile performances, she would be styled in an eye-catching, glamorous manner with sultry makeup, shiny dresses, and plunging necklines. Often made out of satin or chiffon, these dresses immediately looked more expensive and luxurious than what she'd been wearing previously. We also saw her begin to gravitate towards specific designers, wearing Hervé Leger on multiple occasions. Her color palette was more muted than it had been previously, featuring silvers, whites, blacks, and navies, with the occasional pop of pink or purple. It also became more common to see Rihanna in sexier outfits, tying into the sensual direction of the album, as seen with the music video for Unfaithful. Although they were able to cultivate a cohesive aesthetic for formal events, on more casual occasions they struggled, with these outfits often feeling more appropriate for a 40-year-old instead of a teenager. Nobody was safe from business casual in the 2000s. While this era was exponentially more refined than the prior one as a whole, it was severely lacking in personality, and visually there wasn't much that differentiated her from the likes of other R&B singers like Christina Milian, Omri, or Cassie. Critics even said that her sound and style seemed to be mimicking Beyonce's, an idea Rihanna outright rejected, and later on she would blame Def Jam for the rather uninspired visuals for this era, saying in an interview with Oprah in 2012, quote, I felt like they were giving me a blueprint. They had a brand. They had an idea of what they wanted me to be without figuring out who I was. At the 2007 Grammys, Rihanna wore a green gown that could be seen as a callback to the dress that she wore in the music video for SOS, her first number one single. But what actually made the look memorable was her hair, which she had chopped into a long bob, subtly announcing to the world that a new era was on the way. In June 2007, she released Good Girl Gone Bad, which is widely considered to be her breakthrough album, winning her her first Grammy and catapulting her to mainstream attention. A departure from the Caribbean sound of her previous releases, the pop project marked a significant turning point in Rihanna's career in more ways than one, with her look becoming increasingly more edgy and high fashion. Considering how formulaic her image had felt during A Girl Like Me, even being referred to as a cookie-cutter teen queen, this change felt like a natural response, especially from a growing 19-year-old. I just took the bad girl attitude of everything and I just did everything my way. I didn't really consult with anybody. I just wanted to do everything the way I wanted to do it. I wanted to look what I wanted to look like. I wanted to dress and sound like what I wanted to sound like. I was just tired of that innocent image that I had. It was just getting a little generic and boring. She was by no means the only teen artist to push back against their wholesome image, as seen with Christina Aguilera for Dirty and Miley Cyrus for Can't Be Tamed. But compared to them, Rihanna didn't receive half as much criticism for the change. After two albums where she had sported long, flowy chocolate brown hair, at the beginning of 2007, she decided to change things up with a dramatic jet black bob, citing Charlize Theron's haircut in the 2005 film Aeon Flux as the inspiration for her new do. She'd eventually ditch the dramatic side bang and opt for a classic blunt bob instead, and in both styles, she experimented with colored highlights that leaned into her bad girl rebrand. When asked about the haircut, she said, quote, I'm not the innocent Rihanna anymore. 
I'm taking a lot more risks and chances. I felt when I cut my hair, it shows people I'm not trying to look or be anybody else. At the start of the era, her casual looks remained a weak point, coming across as generic and unrefined, with the only consistent aspect being their dark color palette. But after hiring stylist Mariel Hen, things improved exponentially. For performances and red carpets, she sported edgy looks that fully distanced her from her Girl Next Door beginnings. The Good Girl Gone Bad album took inspiration from the 1980s, which is something you could see reflected in Rihanna's style, with her onstage attire featuring bodysuits, vinyl, and fishnets. Her formal looks consisted of dresses with bold patterns and colors, or abstract designs with punk elements. On occasion, she dressed in an old Hollywood style, complete with curls, retro silhouettes, and a bold lip. It was around this time that she finally began to be embraced by the fashion industry, not only being dressed by more high-end designers, but even being invited to her first Met Gala, wearing a white George Chakra gown with crystal embellishments. She of course accessorized with some edgy gloves. While Rihanna had had a handful of high fashion moments, the music video for Shut Up and Drive was next level, serving look after look after look. Whether it was the green striped capris with the ripped white tee, the booty shorts with the leather jacket, or the flared star dress and combat boots, if you were around when this video premiered, then odds are you tried to recreate the looks at home. These outfits also seemed to inspire Rihanna herself, with her style choices taking notes from the music video, but by the end of the year, she had decided to kick things up a notch. In early 2008, Rihanna unveiled a song titled Take a Bow, which was one of three new tracks that she would be releasing on the deluxe album Good Girl Gone Bad Reloaded. This reissued album coincided with yet another style change, with one of the most noticeable differences being her hair, which was chopped short into a pixie cut. Tying into the album's pre-existing 80s themes, on occasion she would wear her hair in a faux hawk style, along with other 80s trends including shoulder pads, leather, neon colors, and chunky jewelry. She continued to take inspiration from the 1940s and 50s, but instead of going the old Hollywood glamour route as she had previously, she seemed to be more inspired by pinup models, as seen in the music videos for Rehab and If I Never See Your Face Again. This sort of retro style was worn by a handful of other female musicians in the 2000s, including Gwen Stefani, Christina Aguilera, and Katy Perry, but Rihanna's take on the trend felt more spooky than it did sweet, allowing her to lean into the album's darker sound. These looks weren't that different from what she'd already been wearing, she just seemed more committed to it, which resulted in her style overall coming across as more cohesive. Not to mention, she also seemed a lot more comfortable and confident in the clothes than she had the prior year. In music videos, she was no longer just eye candy, instead being positioned as a femme fatale of sorts, being powerful, angry, and even scary on occasion. This was quite a risky move, as female artists are often warned against depicting these sorts of emotions out of fear that it would cause their fan base to find them unlikable. As if to circumvent that potential issue, we saw Rihanna become more involved with charitable causes, becoming the celebrity ambassador for the Gucci UNICEF campaign, and participating in a stand-up to cancer telethon alongside other celebrities like Beyonce, Miley Cyrus, Mariah Carey, and Fergie. Although she'd gotten a handful of tiny tattoos previously, 2008 is when she went all in on the body art, getting a skull on her ankle, love on her finger, and her best friend's birth date on her shoulder. She also got two of her most iconic tattoos at this time, the shh on her finger and the stars down her neck and back. The shh eventually became one of her most widely copied tattoos, with fellow celebrities Lindsay Lohan, Lily Allen, and Cher Lloyd sporting similar ink. The stars were designed to match the behind-the-ear tattoo of then-boyfriend Chris Brown. Both of these iconic tattoos were done by Keith Scott Bang Bang McCurdy, who has continued to work with Rihanna to this day. With Good Girl Gone Bad producing hit after hit, Rihanna was scheduled to perform at the 51st Grammy Awards on February 8, 2009, but the performance was abruptly canceled the night of. Rumors quickly surfaced that the reason for the sudden cancellation was due to a physical altercation involving Rihanna and Chris Brown, who Rihanna had been dating since 2007, with the couple even being referred to as the Justin and Britney of the hip-hop scene by the media. Leaked photos of Rihanna's injuries spread like wildfire, and a month later, Brown was officially charged with assault, which he eventually pled guilty to. 
Although he lost a few endorsements and his music was briefly banned on the radio, Chris Brown's career was only temporarily halted by this scandal, being invited to perform at the BET Awards the following year, where he proceeded to break down in tears, resulting in many members of the audience announcing their support and forgiveness, completely disregarding the fact that he had confessed to abusing one of their peers. 13 years later, Brown's career is still going strong, but I do wonder how differently things would have played out in this day and age with Rihanna's current level of fame. While all of this was playing out, Rihanna had stayed quiet, refusing to comment on the matter and going about her business as usual. As if needing to create some space between her and the music industry, we saw her lean into fashion like never before, attending her second Met Gala and sitting front row at various shows at Paris Fashion Week. This seemed to have a huge effect on her style philosophy, with her clothing becoming way more high fashion. And in my opinion, this set the foundation for the Rihanna we see today. In November 2009, Rihanna released her fourth studio album, Rated R, which featured rock and dubstep elements with a darker, angrier, more foreboding sound that was no doubt influenced by the difficult events in her life. In an interview with Diane Sawyer, she finally opened up about what had happened with Chris Brown, showing an unbelievable amount of strength and composure for someone who is only 21 years old. Although she had already shaved the sides of her head and had been sporting blonde highlights for several months, she took the plunge and bleached her entire head, styling it in an assortment of ways that called back to Good Girl Gone Bad. Less concerned with what was considered attractive and more about expressing herself to the fullest, Rihanna's red carpet and performance attire became more avant-garde, featuring unconventional silhouettes and unique textures. She was steadily wearing more and more cult brands like Alexander Vautier, Victor and & Rolf, and Ellie Saab. And while she was commended for her risk-taking, she ironically wound up on a good deal of worse dress lists that year. Her everyday style, which incorporated some of the hip-hop elements we'd grown accustomed to, were often oversized, featured animal prints, and were slightly androgynous. She often wore white, gray, and black with the occasional pops of color, all of which mirrored the more morose tone of the album. Even the music videos released during this time period were less colorful, apart from Rude Boy, which many saw as a return to her roots with its Caribbean-inspired sound and visuals. I'm not going to lie, this is probably my least favorite of Rihanna's style eras. The hair color completely washed her out, and I just don't think that the gigantic shoulders were the right move. It was giving Nosferatu, and not in a good way. Not to mention that in hindsight, it just doesn't feel like her. In mid-2010, Rihanna dyed her hair Little Mermaid red, signaling the start of something new. Unnatural hair colors were all the rage at the time, with other artists like Nicki Minaj, Katy Perry, and Lady Gaga completing the rainbow on the red carpet. In June, Rihanna collaborated with Eminem on the single Love the Way You Lie, which became an instant hit. The music video, which starred Megan Fox and Dominic Monaghan, featured depictions of domestic violence, which many interpreted as Rihanna's way of reclaiming what had happened the prior year, with some critics saying that art was imitating life. She kept the red bob for a few months, before eventually debuting a shoulder-length curly style that would prove to be iconic. Loud was released in November 2010, and marked a return to the bright and optimistic sound of her first two albums, with its debut single, Only Girl in the World, immediately solidifying the aesthetics of the era. A Tumblr dream, the music video featured lace bustiers, knee-high socks, floral prints, pastel colors, and eccentric hair accessories, all of which were trending at the time due to a retro revival in fashion. Rihanna had fooled around with this sort of mid-century pinup style back in 2008, but this time around she did away with any of the punk elements, instead combining this vintage aesthetic with contemporary casual attire. What really sold this retro inspiration was her hair, which would often be styled in victory rolls, beehives, and pin curls. It feels really loud and liberating, you know, it's not a very quiet color and it, it grabs a lot of attention, I, I have to say, whether it's positive or negative, but I love it. I don't know why, I just really like it. I think it's really expressive and daring. Around this time, Rihanna released the perfume Rebel Fleur, officially marking her first business venture outside of music. The product was marketed as a representation of her personality, being equal parts rebellious and sweet, and this duality was highlighted in her clothing choices as well, with her everyday style being fairly toned down, while her performance attire was bright and bold with continued retro influences. 
In 2011, she began working with stylist Mel Ottenberg, who took her red carpet looks to the next level, pulling designs from the likes of Jean-Paul Gaultier and Christian Dior. Rihanna also landed her first Vogue cover that year, confirming that she'd been acknowledged by the fashion industry at large. In August 2011, she debuted a new hairstyle of bouncy ombre curls, which was quickly followed by the release of We Found Love, the first single off her album Talk That Talk, which was recorded during the European leg of the Loud Tour. This started what I consider to be Rihanna's London era, with the singer appearing on the covers of several British magazines, performing at UK festivals, collaborating with Coldplay, referencing British films in her music videos, and even being a presenter on the reality competition show Styled to Rock. This happened to coincide with a 21st century British invasion, with One Direction releasing their debut album, the royal wedding of Prince William and Kate Middleton being the event of the year, Doctor Who's fan base nearly tripling because of social media, and the entire world gearing up for the London Olympics. With people becoming so fascinated with all things UK, it wound up influencing fashion. With riffs on the British slogan, keep calm and carry on from World War II becoming popular, and Union Jacks appearing on just about anything. The irony of a bunch of Americans wearing that flag is not lost on me. Her style in the first few months of this era was a combination of 1950s Americana, 1980s British punk rock, and 1990s hip hop, essentially putting elements of her prior eras into a blender. As a result, she was often spotted wearing camo print, varsity jackets, bandanas, plaid, denim, platform shoes, graphic tees, and overalls. As a soft grunge girly, her looks during this period of time were right up my alley. In early 2012, she switched up her hair once again, opting for a layered blonde do. She also phased out the 1950s influence in her street style and leaned into the 90s vibes instead with sheer pieces, knee-high boots, and tailored trousers, which created a sleek and sexy look that was similarly reflected in her red carpet attire. Honestly, she was giving model and I wish it hadn't been so short-lived. A few months later, she dyed her hair black and shaved it on one side, an unconventional style that had been sported by Cassie a few years earlier. Whether Rihanna was doing press for Battleship, shopping in Cannes, sunbathing in Barbados, partying at Coachella, or performing at the Victoria's Secret fashion show, she always looked like she was having the time of her life. There was an effortlessness to her style at this point, where it just felt like everything worked without even having to try. Tying into the 90s model vibes from earlier, it also became more common to see Rihanna wearing Chanel accessories, a brand that she still gravitates towards today. Despite spending the year traveling all over the world, she still had enough time to record a new album, releasing Unapologetic in November 2012. The album notably included a song that featured ex-boyfriend Chris Brown, who Rihanna had reconnected with earlier that year. Critics and fans alike were quick to voice their opinions on the matter, with some saying that Rihanna was setting a bad example by re-entering a relationship with her abuser. Tying into the unapologetic message of the album, Rihanna brushed these criticisms aside, insisting that things were different now. It almost felt like we'd gone back in time, with Rihanna even looking like she had when she and Chris Brown were initially dating, having chopped her hair into a dark pixie cut that was reminiscent of her hairstyle during the Good Girl Gone Bad Reloaded era. Again, considering her sorry-not-sorry sorry attitude at the time, I'm inclined to believe that the resemblance was intentional. Her style switched between minimal chic and feminine hip-hop, with an emphasis on figure-hugging silhouettes, short hemlines, neutral colors, and eye-catching accessories. Interestingly, Miley Cyrus would begin dressing in a similar fashion shortly after for her Bangers album, which took notes from the R&B scene, and I do have to wonder if she was purposely trying to replicate Rihanna's look. Rihanna had long been considered a sex symbol by the general public, but GQ made it official by crowning her their Hot Woman of the Year in 2012, making her the first woman to grace the cover of the magazine. She embraced the sexy image in the music videos for Unapologetic, appearing nude in Stay and dancing provocatively in Pour It Up. In January 2013, Rihanna's hair got longer and browner, and she shaved the side of her head once again. She changed the styling of it multiple times over the course of several months, going blonder at some points or making her hair fuller at others. Clothing-wise, it was more of the same, either going in a more chic direction or more streetwear. That spring, she also released her first women's collection at London Fashion Week in collaboration with the brand River Island and designer Adam Selman, hinting at the fashion empire that was to come. In the fall, Rihanna debuted a shaggy mullet, which you'd think would be a recipe for disaster, but all it did was make her look instantly cooler, 
she truly felt like that girl. And once again, I wish we'd gotten to see more of it. Her makeup throughout this era was kept relatively simple, apart from a bold lip, experimenting with reds, purples, pinks, and even blues. In 2014, Rihanna parted ways with Def Jam Recordings, the label that had helped launch her career nine years earlier, and she signed with Rock Nation instead. Around this time, she decided that she would take a hiatus from music in order to pursue other artistic and creative projects, although she still wound up releasing several standalone singles. These songs all had vastly different sounds and aesthetics, not only highlighting Rihanna's range, but also making it clear that she had more creative control and independence at this stage in her career. This flexibility was reflected in her clothing choices, as her look was no longer dictated by the visuals of a single album. Whether she was headed to the dentist, sitting outside a basketball game, or taking over Paris Fashion Week, Rihanna was consistently wearing amazing outfits that showed off her personality while also pushing the boundaries of fashion. She wore her black hair in an assortment of ways, long and wavy, in bantu knots, in a sharp lob, and another mullet. She was also spotted in luxury brands consistently, ranging from Versace to Miu Miu to Louis Vuitton. Her coat collection was also incredibly impressive, something that's only gotten better with time. It was clear that at 26 years old, Rihanna had finally figured out what she liked, and she wore it so well that we all wound up liking it too. When she was awarded the Style Icon Award at the 2014 CFDAs, it not only felt well-deserved, but a long time coming. Dressed in a sheer Swarovski gown designed by Adam Selman for the occasion, the risque look has now become one of her most memorable moments. Why, my bother you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. They're covered in Swarovski crystals, girl! <laughs> and let's not forget this hilarious quip, which highlighted how Rihanna was unafraid of pointing out the ridiculous expectations the media often directed towards female artists. This comment also solidified how comfortable Rihanna was with her sexuality, refusing to let others shame her for expressing herself. This look was so impactful that in the months that followed, we proceeded to see dozens of glittery, naked dresses at high-profile events, but none could hold a candle to Rihanna's. That same year, she also became the creative director for Puma, which honestly seemed like a match made in heaven, as sportswear elements had been a consistent part of her style for years. Her first collection for the brand, released the following year, was a massive success, with the Fenty Puma Creeper sneaker selling out in mere hours, eventually becoming one of the most coveted shoes of the year right alongside the Adidas Yeezy Boost. In 2015, she was chosen as the new face of Dior, making her the first black woman to be the face of the brand in its over 70 year history, which really emphasized how famous she had become. She also dyed her hair red, although in a less saturated shade than five years prior, which set people abuzz as they wondered what she could be up to. While many hoped for an album, what they didn't know was that she was ramping up for her most iconic look to date. In May, she attended her sixth Met Gala, where she proceeded to steal the show, being one of the most talked about celebrities of the night. Now, Rihanna's previous Met Gala looks had been perfectly fine, but they were nothing compared to the canary yellow gown designed by Guo Pei. Numerous memes sprung up online after the dress was revealed, eventually resulting in Rihanna's gown being credited for reinvigorating the public's interest in the event. After this, she switched to tight brown curls, marking her third major hairstyle change that year. Talk about a chameleon. One day she was soft and demure, the next she was grungy and dark, and then the next she was sporty and relaxed. It was so well established at this point that Rihanna was a trendsetter that other celebrities even cited her as their style inspiration. She had the unique ability of making just about anything look good, a talent that not every person has, so oftentimes when other people tried to recreate her looks, it rarely worked out. This added to the level of respect the public had for her style, as it proved that her aura alone was enough to take an outfit from drab to fab. Rihanna had been incessantly badgered about her eighth album by fans and the media alike, and after months of vague promoting, Anti was finally released in January 2016. The album was more experimental than any of her past work, highlighting her new creative freedom now that she was with a new label, and also making it clear that she considered herself established enough that radio play was no longer vital for her commercial success. At New York Fashion Week, Rihanna debuted her first clothing collection with Puma, which mixed athleisure with punk. Motifs that had become staples of Rihanna's wardrobe, and everything that came down the runway did wind up feeling like stuff that she would actually wear. At the start of the year, she had a chin-length bob, 
which tied into the I'm the boss vibes perfectly. And she also wore sporty looks as an ode to the Puma brand. Later on, she went back to long hair, with these looks continuing to feature the distinctive Rihanna flair that we'd come to recognize. Many of these outfits came straight off the runways, but were styled in unique ways that made them look totally different. One notable aspect of her style was that she wore a wide array of brands and was totally unafraid of mixing them together, something a lot of stylists and celebrities actually shy away from out of fear that they'll step on someone's toes. This really emphasized just how powerful Rihanna's image had become, as she was keenly aware that any brand would leap at the opportunity to be worn by her in any capacity, and wouldn't dare complain about how they were styled. At that year's VMAs, she performed several medleys of her greatest hits, with each segment being given its own elaborate performance, complete with choreography, outfit changes, and giant set pieces. These performances not only highlighted how much Rihanna had grown as an artist over the last decade, but made it clear that she was a star. She was given the Lifetime Achievement Award that same evening, which was presented to her by rapper Drake, who she had collaborated with in the past. The two had also been dating on and off for several years, and when handing her the award, he attempted to kiss her on stage, which she not so subtly declined. Rihanna was notoriously private about her relationships, likely because of the type of attention directed towards her when she was with Chris Brown, and this public display of affection at the VMAs might have had a negative effect on her and Drake's relationship, as a few years later, she mentioned that the two were no longer speaking. In late 2016, filming began on Ocean's 8, with Rihanna specifically requesting that the character, Nine Ball, wear her hair in locks. This was actually a pretty huge deal when it came to representation, as the hairstyle, while a staple of the black community, was still a rarity on screen, especially on women. In fact, it was actually more common to see white actors sport the hairstyle than black actresses, which is yikes on so many levels. Apart from one scene in the film, Nineball's look was rather casual, being a combination of Rastafari clothing and 1970s counterculture styles that included combat boots, overalls, and army jackets. As if inspired by the character, Rihanna's personal style took a more casual turn as well, and even for dressier occasions, she added an urban twist. In 2017, Rihanna's personal style basically fell into one of two camps, structured looks with an emphasis on unconventional tailoring, or casual attire with an avant-garde twist. More often than not, these outfits would have a looser, baggier fit that didn't focus on her figure, which resulted in rumors spreading that she was pregnant because she wasn't showing off her body as much as she had previously. When this obviously wasn't the case, people began to talk about her weight in a negative manner. Rihanna was about to turn 30, an age that the media often categorizes as old and undesirable, and seeing people openly compare her to her teenage self was incredibly disheartening. In typical Rihanna fashion, she shrugged off the comments, and would tell people that she was perfectly content with the way her body looked and that it was normal for a person's weight to fluctuate. In an interview, she even explained that the changes in her body allowed her to explore her style even further. Quote, I really pay attention every day when I go into the closet about what's working for my body that morning. I feel like that's how everyone should go after fashion, because it's an individual thing. And then if you take it further, it's like, what week are you having? You having a skinny week? You having a fat week? Are we doing arms this week? We doing legs this week? We doing oversized? In September, she officially released her revolutionary cosmetics brand, Fenty Beauty. When they first launched, the company quickly made a name for itself for its skin inclusivity, having an unprecedented 40 shades of foundation that made other brands' color range look like a joke. And the product was such a phenomenon that it even led to Time Magazine calling it one of the best inventions of 2017. The popularity of Fenty's foundation eventually led to what was coined the Fenty Effect, which saw other beauty brands diversifying their products and marketing, in part because they wanted to replicate her success, but also because customers were more willing to call them out for their negligence. Earning over $550 million its first year, other celebrities were inspired to enter the lucrative beauty industry, with Selena Gomez's Rare Beauty, Ariana Grande's R.E.M. Beauty, and Lady Gaga's House Laboratories being released in the years that followed to varying amounts of critical and commercial acclaim. Although she had collaborated on a handful of songs over the course of 2017, in 2018 she ignored music entirely in order to focus on other business ventures, with Fenty Beauty launching several products that would proceed to become cult favorites. That same year, she also released a lingerie brand, Savage Fenty, which debuted at New York Fashion Week and was praised for highlighting a wide array of body types and ethnicities on the runway. 
With all of her brands having an emphasis on diversity and inclusivity, it's clear that this sort of representation is something that Rihanna is passionate about, which is understandable as her own body and skin color had been a talking point since she rose to fame. Coinciding with the release of Savage, Rihanna took to wearing figure-hugging silhouettes once again, resulting in a feminine yet edgy look that mirrored the brand's designs. The unofficial Queen of the Met Gala, in 2018, Rihanna had the extremely prestigious position of co-chair for the star-studded event. She took the theme, heavenly bodies, fashion, and the Catholic imagination, literally, wearing a Maison Margiela design that paid homage to the Pope himself. The outfit caused quite a scandal, with people calling it anything from blasphemous to sacrilegious. I personally think that the Catholic Church has bigger problems to deal with instead of getting upset over a celebrity's dress. In 2019, Rihanna expanded her empire even further, launching the Fenty fashion brand under luxury fashion group LVMH, making her the first woman of color to lead an LVMH brand. Her outfits that year were eye-catching and bold, featuring bright colors and fun silhouettes. There was also an air of sophistication to these looks, tying into her newfound career path, but of course, she still knew when to have fun with fashion. In 2020, Rihanna began dating fellow musician ASAP Rocky, who she had not only collaborated with in the past, but had a similar reputation for being incredibly stylish. Throughout 2020 and 2021, the pair were a fashion dream team, often pictured strutting about New York City in complimentary outfits. Rihanna's outfits moved away from the sort of avant-garde power dressing of recent years and went all the way back to the edgy experimental style that she'd worn back in 2015, but with fewer sportswear motifs and more early 2000s influences. She often combined masculine and feminine trends together, something she'd done consistently since she was a teenager, which is something I'd consider a staple of her style philosophy. In February 2022, Rihanna announced that she was expecting her first child with ASAP Rocky in a candid, paparazzi-inspired photo shoot, a concept that I find to be rather clever since that style of photo was heavily associated with Rihanna's effortlessly cool image. The outfit she wore for the reveal could not have been more perfect, as it fully embraced everything the public adored about her style. Never embarrassed of her changing body, Rihanna boldly showed off her baby bump underneath a hot pink Chanel puffer coat paired with baggy jeans and Chanel jewelry, tying together style motifs that had been present in her outfits for over 15 years. Just looking at these photos, you can still tell that she's that girl from Barbados who dropped out of high school to pursue her dreams. By continuing to dress in her usual edgy, sexy way with low-rise jeans, high heels, crop tops, and underwear as outerwear, Rihanna's maternity style rebelled against the status quo and challenged antiquated beauty standards. Although some of these outfits were criticized for being inappropriate, with people even saying that she was using her child as an accessory, Rihanna's style during her pregnancy wound up becoming incredibly influential not only for hot mamas, but in general. And by refusing to change her clothing just because she was pregnant, Rihanna told the entire world that they wouldn't be able to reduce her entire identity to just being a mother. Rihanna worked with stylist Jaleel Weaver on her pregnancy looks, and when asked about their approach to her style, she said, quote, it's too much fun to get dressed up. I'm not gonna let that part disappear because my body is changing. I'm hoping that we're able to redefine what's considered decent for pregnant women. My body is doing incredible things right now, and I'm not going to be ashamed of that. This time should feel celebratory, because why should you be hiding your pregnancy? Here, here. In May 2022, she gave birth to her first child, and her postpartum looks followed the usual Rihanna formula of effortless edginess. Exciting news arrived in September when it was announced that Rihanna would be performing at the 57th Super Bowl halftime show, marking her first live performance in five years. To say fans were excited would be an understatement. On February 12th, 2023, Rihanna took to the stage in a bright red ensemble with pieces from Loewe, Maison Margiela, and Alaya. During the performance, it became clear that Rihanna had a surprise guest with her, her second child, which her team confirmed the following day. As if being the most watched halftime show of all time wasn't enough, this pregnancy announcement practically broke the internet, and Rihanna was all anyone could talk about for a solid week. With the cat officially out of the bag, Rihanna began boldly showing off her baby bump in a continuation of the style she'd worn during her first pregnancy. She gave birth to her second child on August 3rd, 2023, and that same year, it was also announced that she was officially a billionaire, with her various Fenty ventures making her one of the richest women in the entertainment industry. Although she's released a handful of singles these last few years, it doesn't seem as though the ninth album is coming anytime soon, which is understandable considering all of the other things she's got on her plate. 
but let's keep our fingers crossed anyway. It's been nearly two decades since Rihanna first burst onto the scene, and she's since accomplished feats that many thought were impossible. Constantly keeping us on our toes, it's hard to say what Rihanna will get up to next, but one thing's for sure, she'll look great doing it. Which of Rihanna's many fashion eras is your favorite? I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Bye!